OK, uh, let me start with a couple of comments about the quizzes. Uh, this was a bit harder than the first one uh, because there were a couple of slightly messy um, series problems. By and large, people who knew what they were doing did quite well on it. There was one perfect paper, but the person who got the perfect paper also did better than any of the two dozen undergraduates in Math 138 uh, last <laughs> spring, and so is a special case. Uh, there's a makeup available on uh, Sunday of this week. Uh, the usual deal, I will email it out to people who might want to take it, and uh, you have to have someone around, can perfectly well be a friend of, or a relative, who will uh, sign off on the fact that you only spent an hour on it and that you didn't use any references. Uh, I would say if you got 14 or less, it's probably worth investing an hour and taking the makeup in order to bring it up to 16. I myself wouldn't take the time with a score of 15 or 15 and a half. However, I will send out the makeup to everyone who took the first quiz and got less than 16 or who took the first quiz and didn't take the second quiz because I know there's at least one member of the class who was out of town on a business trip and planning to do this as his first try. Um, the other news is casino night. So let's make this the first topic, uh, topic zero, casino night. Uh, <clears throat> first, the practical issues. Uh, we have the use of the Quincy House Senior Common Room, which is a rather fancy place. Here's how you find it. Here's Harvard Square. And here's Mount Auburn Street. And we're way over here somewhere. You go down Mount Auburn Street, and it crosses Plimpton Street. Turn there and go into the main gate of Quincy House. The building goes around like this. My apartment, for those of you who visited, is over there. But what you want to do is go in here and around to the back to the senior common room. By the time you arrive, we will probably already be playing the James Bond music. And uh, the deal is this. Guests are more than welcome. Uh, if you have a uh, partner who wants to know what this course is all about, say, well, come on along, and you can find out what a Harvard Extension course is like. Uh, Fancy dress is encouraged. The deal is show up, dress for class. You get 300 bucks in play money. Uh, show up, gentlemen in a jacket or tie, or women in a skirt or dress. You get 400. Uh, show up in a tux or a floor length gown with high heels. You get 500 to play with. Same goes for your partner. So two people dressed up like James Bond and consort can get 1,000 bucks to start playing with. At the end of the evening, report your winnings, be they positive or negative. Whoever uh, has won the most or lost the least, if everyone loses, gets five points of extra credit. Second place gets four points and uh, so on down. Wait, do you mean wins the most or has the most at the end? I mean wins the most. So that uh, if, if you and your date start with $1,000 and end up with 1200 and someone else uh, starts with 300 ends up with 600 the greater winning, uh, we'll keep track. Well, we can figure out how much you got by looking at you. Uh, it would be very unseemly to show up in a tux uh, and slip out and um, change into street clothes and hope that nobody <laughs> noticed. But uh, it's how much you cash out with minus how much you got to start with. Uh, we will have alcoholic and non-alcoholic sparkling wine and a few snacks available. And um, this should be a lot of fun, but it will also give you a chance to put some of your theory into practice. And here are the games we'll have. 
We'll have craps. Uh, I've discussed craps in numerous examples from the start of the course. You'll discover when you actually get to the craps table that there are all sorts of oddball bets that you can place. But the fellow who runs it, who's going to be uh, Chris, our course assistant, delights in explaining all the subtleties of craps to uh, students. So you'll have no difficulty catching on to the subtleties. However, as some of us were discussing before cl class, craps is a very nearly fair game. I passed out the calculation in the latest packet. If all you do is bet for or against the shooter, uh, then you'll collect something like 49. You've got a 49.6% chance of winning. So it's very, very close to a fair game. Furthermore, <clears throat> you will learn that uh, if the shooter has a point to make and you've already placed a bet on the person who's playing, you get to make an absolutely fair so-called odds bet on the shooter. So uh, if you want to have a decent expectation, craps is probably the best of these games. Um, blackjack is an interesting exercise in conditional expectation because while your expectation at blackjack is slightly negative overall, there are certain situations in which your conditional expectation is positive. A very, very simple rule is if there are lots of 10-point cards, 10s, jacks, queens, and kings remaining to be dealt, the odds turn in your favor. If there are lots of low cards, 2s, 3s, 4s, and 5s, the odds turn in the dealer's favor. And you can go on the internet and find a dozen card counting systems. I have no objection to people bringing along tables for black, black jack, to bringing along uh, pieces of paper on which they make notes. As long as you don't hold up the game, card counting is encouraged. And finally, there's roulette. I could not buy a European roulette wheel. My wife got all our equipment over the internet. Uh, so we have an American roulette wheel. That has a zero and a double zero on it. And that makes the odds so bad that no reasonable person would play roulette when craps and blackjack are available. So what we're going to do is ignore the double zero. If a double zero comes up, we just spin the wheel again. The odds are still slightly against you because there's a zero on the wheel. And one of the homework problems, which is not due until the week after next, but which I'd encourage you to do before next week, is to figure out how long a certain amount of money would last if you just consistently make bets on red or black or odd or even, something that pays off two for one on a roulette wheel. Questions about casino night? Yes? Uh, how many decks are for the blackjack? Oh, we're going to play with three. <laughs> and uh, my most expert dealer says it's inconvenient to have to deal with fewer than three. So uh, I asked him what was the smallest number that it was reasonable to play with, and he said three. That's fewer than you will find in most casinos. Uh, I should also say, while I love running these casino nights, and while I have occasionally put leftover change that my wife collected out of my pocket into slot machines. I have never actually played uh, blackjack or craps or roulette in a real casino in my life. So I'm all in favor of doing this for fun, but uh, it's not something you do for profit. And that's the subject of uh, tonight's lecture. Because what I want to do is talk about random walks and get to the subject of gambler's ruin. And the message is going to be, even if you play in a perfectly fair casino, for example, if we discounted the zero as well as the double zero on the roulette wheel, uh, if you're determined just to keep playing, no matter how much money you walk in with, the probability that you will go broke is one. But the expected amount of time it will take for that to happen is infinite. So let me get started down a path that will lead to that conclusion by presenting some examples of random walks. So this is our topic number one, our outline. There are lots and lots of things that happen in everyday life that can be
characterized as random walks. So here are three examples. You know, there are a lot of computer games where you have various levels and uh, you slay the right monster and your level goes up, the monster slays you, your level goes down, and so on. So you can imagine a computer game where maybe arbitrarily the game starts you in level 10, you slay a monster, you go up to 11, one slays you, you go back to 10, down to 9, and you go up and down, and the assumption's going to be that the probability of your moving up a level doesn't depend on what level you're at, doesn't depend on how long you're playing the game. It's a single constant that characterizes the walk. Uh, another one, which given the way this year's Harvard-Yale game uh, turned out, seemed rather too close to reality, begins in the outline, which I wrote before the Harvard-Yale game. Harvard and Yale play an infinite sequence of football games. Well, it almost came down to an infinite sequence of overtimes. And when two teams play with one another, against one another, every time one team, say Harvard, wins, it moves further ahead in the standings. Ever, every time it loses, it moves less far ahead in the standings. And so this graph could also represent the number of games that Harvard is ahead of Yale, starting at zero. Harvard wins, Yale wins, Yale wins, Harvard wins three in a row, Yale wins, and so on. And again, you have to assume that for any game in the series, Harvard has some probability p of winning the game, and Yale has a probability q of winning, which is 1 minus p. And of course, the application for the casino is this. You start, let us say, with uh, $5. You're just getting your feet wet at roulette. <coughs> There's zero. You place a bet on red, and uh, with a probability of 18 out of 37, you will move up to $6. With a probability of 19 out of 37, you'd move down to $4. And as you place these $1 bets, which either win you a dollar or lose you a dollar, your bankroll that you've dedicated to roulette goes up or down. And in this particular case, the assumption is if you ever get down to zero, you're broke and you quit. And some people walk into a casino with the notion that if they ever get a certain amount ahead, they'll quit too. So you might start playing roulette with $5 saying, if I ever get up to $10, I'll go try the craps table. Mathematically, all these things are the same. I'd also like to mention some fancy words. So this is topic two now, random walk terminology. The words don't much matter, but I want to highlight the uh, simplifying assumptions for the random walks. So first thing I want to point out about these random walks is that we're always dealing uh, with a situation where the rules which determine the probabilities are the same for any time. Fancy way to put that is a random walk is temporally homogeneous. That means, in particular, if you imagine a sequence of football games, there is no concept of momentum. Harvard has won the last three games, and therefore the probability that Harvard will win the next game has gone up because Harvard's got momentum. This probability stays fixed. One of the nice things about a casino as a model is the probabilities for a roulette wheel presumably really do stay fixed, whereas the probabilities for sporting events probably change. And the probabilities in computer games probably change because the player will become more skilled with time. Furthermore, I'm assuming 
that the probabilities are the same for every level, which means we're talking about something that is often called spatially homogeneous. All that means is whether you've got $1,000 in your bankroll or $2 in your bankroll, the probability of your winning the bet at the roulette table is the same constant amount of 18 out of 37 if you're betting on red or black. And finally, the rules are the same for any history. And this is known as the Markov property after the person who's regarded as the first to recognize it as significant. What this means is your probability of winning your next bet at roulette is independent of your recent history of betting. The probability that Harvard will win its next game against Yale is independent of how Harvard has been doing in practice recently, and so on. And it's this combination of properties that make this rather complicated <coughs> problem tractable nonetheless. OK, now we can get seriously into the business of gambler's ruin. Uh, and I, yes, this is a separately numbered topic. So I'm on to number three already. And this is probably the most famous example of a strategy that I've now illustrated with at least half a dozen examples where you use conditional probability to take a rather complicated situation that looks as though it's going to require you to sum an infinite series. And by using conditional probability and applying it to the problem, you turn things into an algebraic equation, which you can solve. So that's going to be the strategy here. And the quantity we want to talk about, I'm going to denote by little p sub k. And this is the probability of going broke if you start with k, and let's just call them chips. We're going to count your winnings in. Clearly, uh, if you start with $10, uh, you might have less of a chance of going broke than if you start with $1. It'll turn out you'll always go broke if you have no quitting strategy. But if you decide you're going to leave if you ever get up to $15, you're better off in terms of probability of not going broke if you start with $14 than if you start with $1. Because if you start with $14 and win your first bet, you say, I met Guy Gold for the night. I'm out of here. Whereas if you start with $1, you've got a chance of 50% or a bit more of going broke on your very first bet. And what we would like to do is calculate this quantity, which is really a function of k. For any value of k that's positive, i.e. greater than the amount at which you're already broke, and less than the amount at which you're going to quit, we can calculate a number between 0 and 1. And our strategy here is we'll think about the first bet you place and condition on the outcome of that. And basically, that will tell us enough to solve the whole problem. So I'm going to write this abstractly first, say the probability of ruin, the probability of going broke, is, of course, <coughs> the probability of winning your first bet times the conditional probability of ruin after you have won that bet and are one chip richer, plus the probability that you lose your first bet multiplied by the conditional probability that you will be ruined having already lost that first bet. Everyone comfortable with this general principle? This is the first step in solving many, many interesting probability problems. OK, now let's write this down in terms of p sub k. 
So you start with k chips. The probability of ruin is the probability that you win your first bet, which I'm going to denote by little p with no subscript. This is absolutely standard notation. So you'll have to distinguish between little p and little p sub k times the conditional probability of ruin if you win your first bet. Now who can tell me what that is? K sub one. P sub k sub one. P sub k plus one, right? Because if you win your first bet, you've now got k plus one times, <coughs> and you've got a different probability of going broke. We don't know what these probabilities are, but we're seeing a relationship between them. The probability of losing your first bet is q, which, as always, is 1 minus p. And your conditional probability of losing, of ruin, if you've lost your first bet, is p sub k minus p 1. Sub k minus one. Now, uh, this is an equation of a sort that you probably haven't seen before unless you are a theoretical computer scientist. If you're a theoretical computer scientist, you'll say, hmm, a linear recurrence. But if you're not a theoretical science, computer scientist, you say, hmm. So this can be solved, and it's quite easy to solve. Uh, have any of you taken a course where you've ever solved linear differential equations? OK. There's a lot in common between this strategy and the standard strategy for solving uh, linear differential equations. And this is actually a little bit easier, though it's less familiar. So I will point out very briefly the connection with linear differential equations when it shows up, though it's by no means a requirement for understanding this. This is a linear <coughs> recurrence. And what makes it linear is if I come up with a set of quantities p sub k that solve this, and then use twice that amount or five times that amount, it satisfies the same equation. Furthermore, if I find two solutions to this and add them together, it's another solution. Because every term in here is proportional to p. That's what makes this simple. The simple thing about a linear recurrence is that any linear combination of two solutions is also a solution. That is, a constant times the first solution plus another constant times the second solution is also a solution. And uh, a standard way of solving these is by trial and error. That is, you guess what form a solution might take and see if you can find a solution of that form. And since this one's been around for a long time, a good guess is well known. A guess that's good, because it's going to work, is, well, maybe there is a solution to this where p sub k is just some quantity x raised to the kth power. And if we can figure out the value of x, then we're in business. This is like those differential equations where you say, you know, I just have a hunch that there's a solution to this equation of the form x equals e to the alpha t, if only I could figure out some value of alpha. So let's plug this in. We're guessing that p sub k is x to the k. <coughs> so p sub k plus 1 is x to the k plus 1. And p sub k minus 1 is x to the k minus 1. And now you see x to the k is a common factor and drops right out of consideration. It's slightly more convenient for me to pull out a factor of x to the k minus 1, turning this into x equals p x squared plus q. And that's a quadratic equation. We can solve quadratic equations. Any of you who have studied solving second order linear differential equations may remember that you can quickly turn those into quadratic equations that get you the alpha in e to the alpha x. OK? Um, I can solve this by factoring. It's going to be a little bit of a squeeze to get this on the board, so I'll do it here. Px squared 
minus, I've got to bring the x to the other side, and I'm going to be very clever. And instead of writing the coefficient as just 1, I'm going to write it as p plus q. p plus q has been stuck in in front of x. That's perfectly legitimate because p plus q equals 1. So there's my quadratic equation. And that is easy as can be to factor because it factors into px minus q times x minus 1 equals 0. There's px squared minus p plus q times x plus q. And so the solutions are x is equal to 1 or x is equal to q over p. <coughs> so that means we have found two values of x for uh, which we have a solution. A constant would do it, or x raised to the q over p power would do it. But that's not enough for our purposes, because we're talking probabilities. All these p sub k's have to be things that are not negative and not greater than 1. And furthermore, there are some features of the problem that we haven't managed to work in yet. Like, for example, that if you have zero chips, the probability of your ruin is 1 because you're already broke. Whereas if you have so many chips that you're going to leave the casino, your probability of ruin is 0 because you're out the door and you're not going to place any more bets. Fortunately, we've got two solutions to work with. And those of you who have studied linear differential equations may remember the uh, phrase that describes what we use next. If you have a differential equation and find a couple of solutions and are trying to figure out which mix of the solutions is the right one for your problem, you use the Boundary conditions, oh. right? Okay. So uh, we're going to use boundary conditions for our problems, too. Hey, I actually got the right number of blanks. Uh, and the boundary conditions are this. If you have zero chips, what's the probability of your going broke? One, mm. right? Because you're already broke. And because the book does it this way, I'm going to introduce capital K as the number of chips at which you decide to quit. If you have so many chips that you're going to leave the casino and never place another bet, your probability of ruin is zero. zero. OK, now I'm going to have to clear the board to uh, work out a detailed solution to this. Any questions about what's up here so far? OK, so what we have is a general solution to the problem of the following form. P sub k is some constant, which I will call capital A, plus some other constant times q over p raised to the kth power. If you're playing at a casino where you have one chance in three of winning and two, -thirds, two chances in three of losing, then q is 2 thirds, p is 1 third, and this quantity would be 2. So p sub k would be of the form a constant plus some other constant times 2 to the kth power. And I will work out a numerical example as soon as I do the general theory. And when I put this on uh, an exam, 
I will give you a numerical example because it's actually much easier to work with this numerically than algebraically. But I think I really should do the general uh, solution once. It looks messy. It's the same as a numerical version. But it looks messy because you've got all these fractions and k's kicking around. OK. So my boundary conditions here are p sub 0 equals 1 and p sub capital K is equal to 0. And now we just got a little bit of algebra to do. Let's set k equal to 0. When we set k equal to 0, we have a plus b times q over p to the 0, which is 1. So a plus b has to equal what? One. <coughs> one. One. Oh, one. Okay. Because if I substitute k in on the right hand side, I get a plus b. But we've already agreed that p sub zero has to equal one. We'll set k equal to capital K now, and we get a plus b times q over p raised to the capital K power equals zero. zero. <coughs> and now this is just screaming out, subtract me, subtract me. So I will subtract the bottom equation from the top equation and get b times 1 minus the quantity q over p raised to the capital K power is equal to <coughs> one. No, I've done this wrong. I... No, that's fine. And I'll solve this for b. What I'd like to do, since I want this turned around, is to write the solution as b is minus 1 divided by q over p raised to the capital K minus 1. And then a, of course, is just 1 minus b. Uh, so we've now solved the problem. We can write down the solution. The solution to the gambler's ruin problem is this. p sub k is going to equal a plus b times this. And a is 1 minus b. So I will begin by writing down my a. This is just a little note that I'm writing down a. And the first part of the a that I want to write down is this uh, 1 here. 1 is, of course, q over p e to the capital K minus 1 divided by q over p to the capital K minus 1. So there's my 1. And then a is 1 minus b. So I have to add minus b into that. That's easy. <coughs> b is minus 1 over this denominator. So minus b is plus 1 over that denominator. And finally, I have to add in b times q over p to the k. Well, b is this. So when I multiply it by q over p to the little k, I get that. And there's my answer. Uh, I'm going to tuck the answer over here because I want to leave room to do a numerical example. Everyone can see this one? Yeah. OK. So my solution is p sub k is equal to the ones obligingly cancel. q over p to the capital K power 
minus q over p to the little k power divided by q over p to the capital K power minus 1. Now let's check this. Uh, yes? Can I suggest you switch markers? That one's getting challenging to read. Um, it may just need a rest. I gave the blue one a try. The blue one was causing some erasure problems, but we'll see what we can do with it. OK, so I'm going to give an example that's so appalling that even the Lottery Commission hasn't thought of it, but the numbers work out neatly. So what I'm going to do is assume that you buy a lottery ticket for a dollar. You've got a probability of 1 fourth when you scratch it that it will be worth $2 and a probability of 3 fourths that when you scratch it, it will be worthless. And the only thing to be said in favor of this lottery is q over p is an integer. So it will be easy to calculate the various powers of q over p to the k. So let's do this. Now, uh, I'm also assuming that k equals 4, which means you quit. And so the question is, if you start with 1, 2, or $3 and play this lottery until you either go broke or hit $4 and leave the store, what's the probability of your going broke? And we believe we now have the answer to this question. Uh, let's first work out p sub 4. p sub 4 is 3 to the 4th minus 3 to the 4th over 3 to the 4th minus 1, which is 0. zero. We set it up to be that way. So we haven't made any mistakes in algebra. This boundary condition that we can't be ruined if we get up to $4 because we'll quit is satisfied. Now we can work out p sub 3. p sub 3 is 3 to the fourth minus 3 cubed over 3 to the fourth minus 1. That's 81 minus 27 or 54 over 80, which simplifies a little bit to 27 over 40. p sub 2 is 3 to the fourth, which is 81, minus 3 squared, which is 9 over 80. That's 9 tenths. p sub 1 is equal to 81 minus 3 over 80, which is 39 over 40. And finally, p sub 0 is 81 minus 1 over 80, which is 1. So the solution has come out more or less the way we expected. If you start with only a small amount of money playing this lottery, the probability that you will be ruined before you achieve your goal of $4 is very close to 1. Uh, and the more money you start with, the smaller the probability that you will be ruined, the greater the probability that you will achieve your goal of $4 and quit. Uh, let's just check one numerical case. Let's check the case where we recalculate <coughs> p sub 2. In other words, pretend that we have lost that number and want to reconstruct it. But someone says, hey, I know because I read it in the newspaper that if you have $3 when you start to play this game, you've only got 27 chances in 40 of going broke. Whereas if you start with only $1, you've got 39 chances in 40 of going broke. You say, aha, then I can work it out. Because what's going to happen if I start with $2? Well. 
a quarter of the time, I will win. Then I'll have $3, <coughs> and my probability of going broke will be 27 fortieths, whereas three quarters of the time, I will lose a dollar. I'll be down to one dollar. I'll have 39 chances in 40 of going broke. And when I add these, I get 27 plus uh, 117 over 160, which is, in fact, 9 tenths. So this is a self-consistent set of numbers. You can calculate any of them from the one just above it and the one just below it. And furthermore, you can't get ruined if you've reached the amount where you're going to walk out of the convenience store. You're sure to be ruined if you have no money left to play the lottery with. So we solve the problem. However, there's one case where this solution doesn't work. Uh, what is the value of q over p for which the solution that I wrote down, which had a q over p to the capital K minus 1 in the denominator, is nonsense. q over p is 1. When q over p is 1, and that's not an oddball case, that's the case of a fair game. So we have solved the problem for any value of p between 0 and 1, except for the most interesting value of all, namely 1 half. Uh, so we're now on to the next name topic. I can erase this one. This is ruin in a fair casino. Okay, I come with K dollars to play. Half the time I will win a bet, and I'll have K plus one dollars to play with. Half the time I'll lose my first bet, and I'll only have K minus one dollars to play with. And the difficulty with this is if we solve it by the previous techniques, both solutions to the quadratic equation turn out to be the same. And those of you who are intimately familiar with second order linear differential equations, they remember that that's a special case there also. You generally expect to find two solutions, but sometimes you only find one. And you may even remember the trick there is you multiply the solution you found by t, or whatever your independent variable is, and try again, and the same trick works. So I can say, let's try this solution, p sub k equals k. And sure enough, k is equal to 1 half of k plus 1 plus 1 half k minus 1. So it works. And now we can very easily put in the boundary conditions. So in the fair case, The solution is just of the form a plus b times k. And we can impose our boundary conditions. p sub 0 on the one hand is a plus b times 0. But p sub 0 has to be what? 1. You're broke. So a is equal to 1. That's nice to know. Now we only have to work out what b is. p sub capital K is equal to a, which we now know is 1, plus b times capital K. And p sub capital K, capital K being the amount of cash which will cause you to quit playing the game. P sub capital K is? Remind me. Zero. It's 0, isn't it? So B is equal to minus 1 over capital K. 
And when we put this together, we get P sub K is equal to A, which is 1, plus B times K, or 1 minus little k over capital K. Well, that's <clears throat> nice. This is actually so, so simple, you can remember it. Here's a graph of P sub k. as a function of the amount you start with. If you start with the amount that will cause you to leave the casino instantly, you can't go broke. If you start with no money, you're broke to start with. And in between, the function is just linear. So if you go into a fair casino with $10, having in mind you leave, if you get $20, you'll leave if you go broke. The probability is the same that you will end up with $20 as with 0, which is actually fairly reasonable when you think about it. Uh, furthermore, if you start with $15 and say, I'll quit at 20 or when I'm broke, uh, then you will have, according to this formula, three chances in four of going out ahead by $5, one chance in four of going out having lost $15. That's consistent with the notion that your expectation in a fair casino is precisely 0. In fact, we could probably have got the same result equivalently by saying that uh, the probability of your going broke has to be consistent with your expectation being precisely 0. Now, why is this called gambler's ruin? Well, the gambler who gets ruined is the one with no quitting strategy. The gambler who just says, I'm going to play and play and play. Uh, and who knows, maybe I can end up with $10 million. Maybe I can end up with enough money to run the Iraq war for two days. Who knows how well I might be able to do. So let's consider the limit as capital K approaches infinity. What's the limit of this function 1 minus little k over capital K for any fixed little k as capital K approaches infinity? 1. 1. So if you have no quitting strategy, even in a fair casino, you are certain to go broke. Your fortunes will rise and fall, but the probability that sooner or later you will end up with little k dollars less than what you started with is 1. Yeah, Jerry? That, that, that's because once, you, once you're broke, you can't play anymore. Right? That's right. That's right. Um, if, you, if you have access to an infinite supply of credit, then this reasoning does not apply. And indeed, you can turn it around. If you have a banker who's willing to underwrite you no matter how far into the red you go, the same reasoning says the probability of your eventually coming out $5 ahead is 100%. But your bank really has to be willing to underwrite arbitrarily large amounts that you're in the hole in exactly the same way that the compulsive gambler we have in mind here can end up with $100 billion and still be unwilling to quit. Uh, just to reverse it, the reason the casino never goes out of business is because effectively it has an infinite amount to play against anybody who comes in. Yes, yes, yes. OK. Um, so you say, that's great. Now I know that I can be ruined. But I've only got two hours next week to be ruined. Casino night starts at 7.35 and ends at 9.35, though I'm willing to keep the casino open till 10 or so if people are having fun. So. The next question to ask, and this is topic five, is how long does it take? <laughs> so this is time until win or ruin. Well, uh, let's introduce a random variable. You go into a casino. 
you sit down at the roulette table and you just keep, keep starting, you start betting on red every single time, over and over and over again. And the random variable that I'm interested in is capital X sub K. And that's the number of plays until ruin starting with k chips. So if you start with one chip, there's a probability a little bit greater than a half that you'll be ruined after one play. If you start with three chips, the smallest possible value for this random variable is three. You have to lose your first three bets. Uh, this has happened to my wife and me on cruise ships from time to time. We'll go into the casino before dinner, uh, each having five or ten quarters to put in the slot machine, put them in zing, 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 zing. Well, we're broke, time to go to dinner. Uh, and sometimes you just go on and on and on. And the way to quantify this time until win or ruin is we want to calculate the expectation of this random variable, right? That's how many plays you expect to get out of the casino with an initial starting stake. And um, on the occasions when I play slot machines, I figure, you know, if I can get uh, an hour of fun out of five dollars worth of change that would otherwise have gone into laundromats, well, that's probably a reasonable investment. So uh, for many people, this is sort of the payoff of doing this. Like the textbook, I'm going to call it m sub k. And it's the expectation of this random variable. <coughs> now, this looks like just an awful thing to calculate, doesn't it? Because at first, it looks as though you're going to have to calculate the mass function for this random variable you're going to have to calculate the probability that you will be ruined after precisely 57 bets or something like that. And that would be a very, very hard thing to do. But nobody asks us for the mass function. We just want the expectation. So let's tackle this by conditional expectation. Of course, we condition on the first bet. Okay. Well, you certainly placed that bet, didn't you? So there's a term of one in there for the first bet you placed. And then you either won the first bet or you lost the first bet. You win your first bet and you say, hmm, now I've got one more chip than I started with. And my expectation for sticking around here is greater than it was before. I expect to be able to go on for m sub k plus 1 plays, whereas with a probability usually a bit greater than a half, you lose that first bet and you say, uh-uh, my time in here is getting even more limited because I now have an expectation of only m sub k minus 1 plays. Now, if it weren't for this one, you'd say, this is something we've seen before. We just solved this one. OK, differential equation experts, what's the term you apply closely related to a term that is applied to milk <laughs> that refers to a situation where you have one of these linear thingies and you throw in a constant term. Homogeneous equation. Non -homogeneous. This is not homogeneous. This is the inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous. Yeah. So if you're trying to relate this to other things you might have heard, it's inhomogeneous. Or if you've never heard any of this stuff before, uh, this is a perfectly good way to be introduced to the study of linear systems. In some ways, this is a much simpler application than uh, standard linear differential equations. Um, if you're really into differential equations, you may remember in this situation 
you use something that's often called the method of undetermined coefficients, which is basically, let's try to guess a solution and make it work. And the same thing works here. Uh, let's just say, I wonder if by any chance there's a multiple of k that works here. Well, let's try it. CK equals 1, I've got 5 minutes left, plus <coughs> P times C times K plus 1, plus Q times C times K minus 1. And we can get rid of all the terms involving CK here. I'll cancel CK from this side and over here. That gets rid of P times CK, and this gets rid of Q times CK. And PCK plus QCK equals CK. So we're rid of almost everything, and we have 0 is equal to 1 plus PC minus QC. And in this case, we've actually succeeded in solving for C. So C is equal to 1 over Q minus P. Now, that's not the general solution to the problem. But uh, once I have this solution, if I add on any solution to the same equation without the 1 in it, I still have a solution because this equals that plus that. And so in this particular case, just for the record, the general solution is CK plus some constant A plus some other constant B times P times Q over P to the K. You could, if you wanted, put in uh, boundary conditions and numbers. I have done this in the notes, but the results are not particularly enlightening. So let's take our break now, and then I will resume with a special case of this, namely the special case where the casino is fair and p equals 1 half. And in that case, we get a particularly simple and very enlightening solution. OK. Uh, we're back to the casino. And suddenly, the game has turned fair. And uh, so this is now topic number six, a fair game. And this is a result which, although not general, is simple and worth memorizing because in a real casino, the house percentage is small enough that for purposes of calculating roughly how many plays you might get from your initial stake, uh, this is a good approximation to the truth. So what have we got? We say m sub k the number of spins of the roulette wheel, which has no 0 on it, that I will get before using up my starting stake of k dollars, is 1 plus 1 half the probability of winning times m sub k plus 1 plus 1 half the probability of losing my first bet times m sub k minus 1. and it turns out that a solution to this is the function m sub k equals minus k squared. If you want to check that, you get minus k squared equals 1 plus 1 half times minus k plus 1 squared minus 1 half k minus 1 squared. And this is a difference. That's a sum of squares. I'll multiply it out. 
minus k squared is equal to 1 minus 1 half k squared minus k minus 1 half minus 1 half k squared plus k minus 1 half minus k squared is equal to the sum of those two terms 1 minus 1 half minus 1 half is 0 minus k plus k is 0 so everything checks so someone found this solution uh, it was a lucky guess and that means the general solution in this case is that m sub k is minus k squared plus any solution to this with the 1 taken away. But that's a problem we have already solved before. We know that without the 1 here, this was the recurrence that we got in the case where we were just trying to figure out the probability of going broke. And in that case, we had the general solution a plus bk. And this is simple enough that we can put in our uh, boundary conditions. If k is equal to 0, if you come into a casino with empty pockets, what's the expected number of plays before you go broke? Zero. Zero. Okay? You never get to play at all. So that says that 0 equals 0 plus a plus 0. And the quantity a has to equal 0. OK, let's set little k equal to capital K. You have decided that if you ever have five chips, you're going to declare victory and leave the casino. You walk into the casino with five chips. What's your expected number of plays? Zero. Zero again which means if we substitute capital K into here, we also get 0. So 0 is equal to minus capital K squared plus A, but A was equal to 0, plus B times capital K. And that tells us what B is equal to. B, therefore, <coughs> has to satisfy B equals k. So that minus k squared plus k squared is equal to 0. And now we've got the general answer. Little m sub k is equal to minus little k squared plus a, which is 0, plus b, which is equal to capital K. <coughs> times little k, which I can also write as little k times capital K minus little k. So this is really as simple as it can be. This factor of little k guarantees that if you come into the casino broke, you'll get no plays. This factor of capital K minus little k guarantees that if you come into the casino with the amount of money you were going to quit with, you won't get any plays. And in between, both these quantities will be positive, and you will get some plays. So let's just do an estimate. Start with $10. Leave if you ever get to $20. So little k is equal to 10. Capital K is equal to 20. And the expected number of plays is 10 times 10, or 100, which really isn't bad. So if you go into a fair casino with 10 chips to use to play roulette, uh, if the 0 didn't exist on the roulette wheel, then you would expect to get an average of 100 plays before you either doubled your stake or went broke. And you figure the 0 is only one of 
uh, 37 slots on the roulette wheel. So there won't be that many zeros that show up in 100 plays. So you probably won't get quite 100 plays, but it's a rough estimate for the number you'll get. And it's really a rather large number. You can say, basically, if you start out with uh, a stake and resolve to stick around till you double it, the number of plays you should get out of a game that's almost fair, something like crap, crap is incredibly close to fair, is roughly the square of the number of dollars that you start with. And uh, now the final thing is, what if you take the limit as capital K goes to infinity? You say, um, I'll walk into a casino with a certain amount of money. This is a fair casino. And I'm going to stick around till I know, go broke. I know my probability of ruin is 1. But I've got these $5. I'm willing to be ruined to the tune of $5. How long do I expect to stay around? What happens to this function for any little k in the limit where capital K goes to infinity? Infinite. It's infinite, even if k is just 1. That's just an amazing result. If you go into a fair casino with $1 and say, I'm going to stick around here until I go broke, the probability that you will go broke on your first play is one half. Nonetheless, the expected number of plays is infinite. Because if you get off on a winning streak to start with, you can get into a situation where it will take you a very, very, very long time to lose your money. And the net effect of that is to make your expectation infinite. So uh, the conclusion on gambler's ruin. Even in a fair casino, the probability of going broke is 1, but the expected length of time it will take for you to do it is infinite. OK, now I'm going to switch to a different <coughs> aspect of random walks that is much less messy mathematically and that leads to some results that were not widely known until comparatively recently and that are highly counterintuitive. And I hope you will be pleased to learn that most of the arguments here are graphical arguments and counting arguments and pairing things up arguments rather than fancy algebraic arguments. So what I want to do is move on to topic number seven and consider a walk as a random variable. So uh, there are various steps in this walk. And we can say for step i, spin i of the roulette wheel, we have a random variable x sub i, which is your winning. And the probability that x sub i is plus 1 rather than minus 1 is equal to p. The probability that x sub i is equal to minus 1 is equal to q, which is 1 minus p. It's possible to extend this to random walks where sometimes you get your bet refunded and so on. But we're going to consider just this simplest case. And if I make a graph of what this looks like, you will end up with a graph that might look like this. And after n steps,
you end up in some level k. Now, in order to figure out, what we really want to figure out is the probability that you will be in level k after step n. And of course, that's the mass function that I said was going to be very hard to calculate. What's the probability that after 57 spins of the roulette wheel, you'll be precisely $5 ahead of where you started? But in fact, we can work this out. And the reason we can work it out is that we can calculate the number of up steps and the number of down steps and then calculating the probability that we will have a certain number of up steps with the remaining steps being down is just the good old binomial distribution. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to solve this problem in terms of the binomial distribution. But that's only easy if we think in terms of the number of up steps and the number of down steps. <laughs> so if in this random walk we have A steps up, A winning bets if you like, A Harvard victories if you like, and B steps down, B losing bets, or B Yale victories if you like, then the total number of steps is equal to A plus B, right? And the level we end up with, k, if we start at level 0, is equal to what in terms of a and b? a minus a minus b. a minus b. And so of course, we can solve for a and b, add these together. We get n plus k is equal to 2a, so that a is equal to 1 half times n plus k, and b turns out to be 1 half times n minus k. Now, these 1 halves are a bit of a nuisance. It makes it look as though you're dealing with fractions. But in fact, you're never dealing with fractions if you play a roulette wheel five times, you can come out $1 or $3 or $5 ahead, but there's no way to come out even or $2 ahead. So either n and k are both even or n and k are both odd. And that means that you're always taking one half of an even number. So don't let these one halves fool you. We're always dealing with integers. And we can now write down the answer. I'll switch markers again. So yep. I... So if I denote by <coughs> S the level that we are at, I can say the probability that the level at step n minus the level at step 0, which I almost always assume to be 0, though it doesn't have to be, the probability that that quantity is equal to little k is the probability of getting A up steps and B down steps. Well, yes? Uh, you've drawn it as if it's positive, but that doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. That's absolutely right. It K uh, is this so, And in fact, maybe I should state the rules have changed a bit now in that 0 is no longer anything special. and. The standard example I would prefer that you keep in mind is a long sequence of football games, say, where either team can perfectly well be ahead. And there's no fundamental distinction between positive and negative. OK. This is easy to work out. The probability of an up step is p.
And the number of up steps we have is a, which is a half of n plus k. The probability of a down step is q. And the number of down steps is 1 half times n minus k. And this isn't quite everything, as a couple of you forgot on the quiz. You have to multiply this by the number of ways of selecting your a up steps and your b down steps out of n steps in all. So what binomial coefficient goes in front of this? n choose. One half of something. Well, one half of something, that's actually a good way of putting it, Katie, because I can either use this or that. It means the same thing. Uh, I will use one half of n plus k. So this problem is one that we have already solved. And uh, a very simple example of this is, let's say we've got two basketball teams that are going to play five games. And I'm going to say they're going to play five games. They're not going to play until one team or the other has won three games. But they're going to play a five-game series. What's the probability that if the Celtics and the Pacers, let's say, play five games, that the Celtics come out three games ahead? And you say, hmm, that's a restatement of a familiar problem. What's the probability that the Celtics will win four games out of five? It's 5 choose 4 times the probability of the Celts winning raised to the fourth power times the probability of the Celts losing raised to the first power. So this is a familiar problem put in new terms. But it leads to one of the niftiest results in the whole uh, subject of random walks, the so-called ballot theorem. Now, in the textbook, the ballot theorem is done after the closely related hitting time theorem. I'm going to do them in an opposite order, because I regard this as the most fundamental of this whole class of theorems. And this is a great result, because the result itself is very easy to remember. There are a substantial number of real life situations to which it applies, and almost nobody knows it. So it's a useful, if obscure, piece of knowledge. And the reason it's called the ballot theorem is that a standard context in which to put it is in an election where there are little a votes for candidate A, that could be Adam, and little b votes for candidate B, who could be Beth. And we're assuming that all the votes are in the ballot box. And in fact, everyone knows that there are A votes for Adam and B votes for Beth. But there's going to be fun in counting these on the local cable channel, for example. <laughs> so they're pulled out of the ballot box in a random order. And an interesting question is, what is the probability that Adam goes ahead from the start and stays ahead, that the election is never tied? And the remarkable result, which I will now prove, is the ballot theorem, which states that if Adam wins by a certain number of votes, if, for example, there are 27 ballots cast and Adam wins by three votes, the probability that Adam is never behind at any stage in the vote count is simply 3 divided by 27, or 1 9. That's what I meant when I said this is a very, very simple result to remember, though not to prove. So now I've got to prove it. Uh, and because I despise dealing with these 1 halves, and because the book does it too, I'm now going to introduce the term 2n to mean the total number of votes. 2n has to be an integer, but 
uh, it's entirely possible that the quantity n, which is half the number of votes, could be half an integer rather than an integer. This is the notation used in the book. And candidate A wins by a number of votes, which I'm going to call 2R. And of course, that's A minus B. This is all correct in the case where N and R are both even. But the results are equally valid in the case where N and R are both odd. Now, the solution of this problem proceeds by a very clever trick. The idea is that when you're trying to count something, sometimes you can't count it directly, but you can figure out that the thing you're trying to count, the set you're trying to count, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of objects that you can count. So you replace it with another. And what can we now count? We can count the number of ways of going from one level at a certain step to another level at another step. Because that's just the number of ways of choosing the total number of up steps out of the total number of steps. That's just a binomial coefficient, right? If you ask me, how many ways are there of going from step one to step five, going up four steps, starting at uh, the second step and going to the 20th step. So stepping up, let us say, four steps in 18 steps, I can say that's easy. In order to go up four steps in 18 steps total, what we need is 10 up steps and six down steps. So the answer is 18 choose 10. OK, here goes. I want to calculate for the ballot theorem, what is the probability that Adam is always ahead? And here is the ingenious way of doing this. If Adam is always ahead, the first vote pulled out of the ballot box has to be a vote for Adam. Adam. So the walk's going to start like that. And it's going to end up after two n steps in level 2r. And some of the time, Adam will never be behind. This is an example of the sort of path we want to count. Now, the sort of path we can count is we have a formula for the number of paths that are at level 1 after step 1 that end up in level 2r after 2n minus 1 more steps. That's just a binomial coefficient. But unfortunately, the paths that go from here to here include some where the election is tied and even include some where uh, Adam is briefly behind. So what we have to do is take the total number of paths that go from here to here and then subtract off all the ones that ever touch 0. Yeah, Jerry? I must have missed you. Is, a, is 2R is A minus B? 2R. Yeah, yeah, oh, I see it's there. It's A minus B. It's the final level achieved, which is votes for Adam minus votes for Beth. That's the 2R is the number of votes by which Adam wins the election. Now, here's the secret of doing this. Let's take, does everyone agree if we can count all the paths and then subtract off the number of paths that involve the election being tied at some point? The remaining path, the diff remaining number of paths, the difference is exactly what we're looking for. Those are the number of ways of counting the ballot so that Adam is never behind. So we want to take all the paths going from here to here and subtract off all the paths that touch the origin. Everyone with me on that? Okay. Now here's how you do this. You take a path that touches the origin 
you find the first place where it touches level 0, the first place where the election is tied, and you flip it over. And this is what the book calls a reflected path. Does everyone see that for any path where the first vote is a vote for Adam and the election is eventually tied, you can come up with a reflected path. And furthermore, from the reflected path, you can reconstruct the original path. So there are exactly as many reflected paths as there are paths that we don't want to include in the count, paths where the election is at some point or another tied. <coughs> so now all we have to do is touch the reflected. Jerry, you look puzzled. I am. But can you formulate your puzzlement? The question I wanted to ask, and it sounds very stupid, I apologize, is what we are actually graphing there is the difference between the two. What we're graphing is Adam's lead as a function of time. Okay. Yes. OK. So um, this is the, at every point, the quantity plotted vertically is the number of votes for Adam minus the number of votes for Beth. So this is Adam's lead. Thank you for bringing that. Understanding that, now everyone agrees, if we can count the number of paths that go from here to here, and then subtract off the number of reflected paths, the difference will be the number of paths that never touch the origin. Well, where is a reflected path after the first step? Below. It's below zero. Adam's behind by one vote in a reflected path. So each reflected path takes us from minus 1 to 2r in 2n minus 1 steps. And that gives me the formula that I want. Here's what I want to calculate. The fraction of the paths that never touch 0 is the difference between the number of these paths and the number of those paths divided by the total number of paths. And we can write that all down in terms of binomial coefficients. First, using the book's notation, the number of paths that go from here to here is equal to the number of paths that are 2n minus 1 steps long. They're 2n minus 1 steps long because they start after one vote has already been counted. And uh, those take Adam from a lead of one vote to a lead of two R votes. So does everyone see my notation? This is the number of votes. This is Adam's starting lead. And this is Adam's final lead. And then I have to subtract off the number of these reflected paths. This is n sub 2n minus 1, where now Adam starts with a lead of 1. No. In a reflected path, oh. after one vote's counted, Adam's lead is negative one. 1. But he ends up with a final lead of 2r. And the total number of paths that go from Adam's lead is 0 because no votes have been counted to Adam's lead is 2r after all 2n votes have been counted is the number of paths of length 2n that go from a lead of 0 votes to a lead of 2r votes. Everyone agree this is the fraction of uh, paths that have the property of never touching 0 again. And it is therefore also the probability that when you count the votes in a random order, the election is never tied, that Adam takes off to an early lead and never loses it. OK, now we can work this out in terms of binomial coefficients. It's a bit of a pain, but only a little bit of a pain. How many steps are there in this one? How many steps does it take to get from 
2n minus 2 1. 2 n. 2n minus 1. Thank you. And if these steps need to carry us from 1 up to 2r minus 1, the number of up steps has to be n plus r minus 1. So we have to choose n plus r minus 1 steps that are up out of 2n minus 1 steps in all. The number of down steps is then what? n minus r, and the total gain is 2r minus 1. So this is just equal to that binomial coefficient. Here we've got the same 2n minus 1 steps. But if, in the counting of 2n minus 1 votes, Adam is reaching a final level, starting from having been one more vote behind, one vote behind instead of one vote ahead, we need one more vote for Adam, one less vote for his opponent, don't we? So here we have 2n minus 1 ballots. And they have to be n plus r votes for Adam and the remaining ones for his opponent. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Now for the denominator. How many steps are there in all? 2n. 2n. And in order to get uh, Adam with a final lead of 2r votes, we need to have n plus r votes for Adam and n minus r votes for his opponent. So when we take the difference between Adam's votes and Beth's votes, we get 2r. And in fact, um, that's another way you can convince yourself that the bottom factors in these are correct. Now, uh, I can figure this out in terms of factorials. So let's write it out. We've got 2n minus 1 factorial over n plus r minus 1 factorial times the difference between that and that, which is n plus r, sorry, n minus r factorial. Let's just check that. If I add this to that, I get 2n. The r's cancel, and I get minus 1. And then I have to subtract off 2n minus 1 factorial divided by n plus r. And to get the same sum without the minus 1 here, I have to have the minus 1 over here, n minus r minus 1 factorial. And then in the denominator, I have 2n factorial divided by n minus r factorial times n plus r factorial. And this may look forbidding, but it's just total number of votes factorial divided by Votes for Adam factorial times votes for Adam's opponent factorial. This is just a binomial coefficient counting the num number of ways of distributing the votes for Adam and the votes for Adam's opponent among the votes that do the job. <coughs> OK, um, now let's do a lot of cancellation. <coughs> I pull out a 2n here, and then I have a 2n minus 1 factorial canceling those. That's very nice. Uh, and now I can fiddle around with the other factors and <coughs> try to fit it all on the board. I've got 2n in the denominator. I'll pull this up into the numerator. So I have n minus r factorial times n plus r factorial over n plus r minus 1 factorial times n minus r factorial. I apologize for the algebra, but I know of no other way of proving this specific result. All the other ones I can do without binomial coefficients n minus r factorial times n plus r factorial from the denominator. 
over n plus r factorial times n minus r minus 1 factorial. Well, well, what have we got? That cancels that. n plus r factorial divided by n plus r minus 1 factorial is n plus r. n plus r. So that's all that's left of the first term. This cancels that. n minus r divided by n minus r minus 1 factorial is n minus r. n minus r over 2n. <coughs> so it started out as a mess, but the answer is simple. It's 2r over 2n. So by this fairly straightforward counting argument, we have managed to prove the ballot theorem. Messy computation, but a very simple result. Well, this deserves an example. Because <laughs> I'll confess, I didn't know about this until two years ago when I started teaching Mathematics 191 in the college. And I found to my surprise that it's not in most probability books. It's one of the nicest results in all of probability. And the reason I chose the textbook that I did, even though the explanations are sometimes a little on the terse side, is this is the only introductory probability book that I can find that has all these interesting topics in it. Uh, other competing books tend to confine themselves to deadly dull topics or to branch off into statistics, which is not the subject of this course, rather than into interesting probability theory. So let's try an example of this, which was the first thing that I did when I saw this. Because even though the proof is straightforward, the result is still so simple as to be very difficult to believe. So here's my example. We'll have 2n equals 7, just to show that it works with 7. Adam gets five votes. His opponent, Beth, gets the other two. And Adam's lead is five minus two, or three. So here's the scenario. There's seven ballots in the ballot box. They're pulled out in a random order. Adam ends up with a three-vote lead. And we can figure out the number of ballot sequences. If you've got a ballot box that has seven ballots, of which five are votes for Adam, what's the number of possible sequences? What's the number of ways of arranging those votes? Seven choose five. Seven choose five, because there are five slots in which to place the Adam votes. Seven choose five is equal to seven choose two, which is easier to calculate. That's seven times six over two or 21. And the theorem says that the fraction where Adam is always ahead, where A always leads, is equal to uh, the number of votes by which Adam wins the election divided by the total number of ballots cast. So that of these 21 ways that the ballots can be arranged, this theorem says 3 sevenths of them, or 9, are sequences where Adam is always ahead, and the other 12 involve a tie somewhere. So that means we should be able to list all of them. Well, let's try it. The most obvious one is you pull out the five votes for Adam in order, and then the two votes for Beth. Uh, finish things off. Or you can have the first four votes for Adam. If the first four votes are for Adam, and the next one is for Beth, then the last two votes can come in either sequence. 
So we found three of them. And then there must be some that begin with three votes for Adam and one for Beth. And in this case, no matter how early the next vote for Beth comes in, there's no way of getting a tie out of this, because Adam's now a two-vote lead is unassailable for Adam. So we can finish this <coughs> off with BAA or ABA or AAB. So we found six of the nine possibilities. OK, what else can happen? Adam gets the first two votes. Beth gets the third vote. Who has to get the fourth vote? Adam. <coughs> and now Adam has a four vote lead, has a two vote lead, and so he can't possibly uh, end up tied. So we can finish this off in exactly the same way. So with substantial effort, we managed to enumerate these in a special case. And if you did this first, you would say, it strikes me as highly implausible that there's a general rule for how many of these things there's going to be. But we've got it. We knew there were going to be nine of them. And uh, eventually, we set out to find them. Now, there's another closely related theorem, which the book unaccountably does first. This one is called the hitting time theorem. And it answers a closely related question about the selection. <coughs> In some orders of the ballots, Adam is never three votes ahead until the election is finally over. Whereas there are other situations where Adam goes ahead by three votes before the election ends and then ba just manages to hold his own up till the end of the election. And an interesting question is, in what fraction of the cases, when you count the votes in this election, does Adam never achieve his final lead until the final vote has been counted? So for the hitting time theorem, here's his final lead, which I will continue to call 2R. 2N votes in the election. And notice 2R was equal to 3 in the numerical example I did. There's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, R being half an integer. All that matters is that 2R is an integer. And in this case, we're perfectly willing to count something like that, even though Adam went behind. No longer do we have the rule, there's no, Adam is not permitted to be behind or even tied in the election. This one is OK, but this one is not. Now, does everyone see this is basically the same problem as before? What we've got is a random walk that goes from one level to another level. And the question is, what fraction of the ways of getting there fail to retouch one or the other of the two levels? And it doesn't make any difference whether it's the final level or the beginning level. And although the book does this theorem quite independently of the ballot theorem, if you go back to the election, there's an obvious way of doing this. Out of any of these outcomes, we can make an outcome that's valid according to this. Let's just uncount the votes. Let's stuff them back in the ballot box. So we start out with Adam three votes ahead and seven votes having been counted. And then we put the ballots one at a time back into the ballot box, putting back uh, the um, five votes for Adam and the uh, two votes for Beth in such a way that we end up with everything even. And all we have to do is reverse these sequences.
So in this case, we'll take this one and write it backwards. B, B, A, 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 A. OK? This is clearly a case where Adam never gets three votes ahead until the election is over. Because how does this work? The only way he could get three votes ahead before the election was over is if we could break off some tail end and say, in that last set of K ballots, he neither gains nor loses. But we started with a sequence where there's no way to break off anything at the beginning that leads to a tie. So if you have a sequence which never leads to a tie when you start from the beginning, and you read it backwards, you can never have a tie by taking a subsequence that starts at the end. And therefore, for, from each path that satisfies the ballot theorem, each path where Adam is never tied after the election starts, we can construct another path where Adam never achieves his final lead until the election is over. And therefore, with no calculation, the theorem is proved. The fraction of sequences of votes for which Adam never reaches his final lead until the last vote has been counted is, again, the amount of his lead divided by the total number of ballots. And that's the hitting time theorem. And the way to remember both of these now is the following. You got a random walk of two n steps. It leads to a change in levels of 2r, which could be positive. It could be negative. Pick either the starting level or the final level, not both, one or the other. The fraction of paths that don't cross your chosen level is the ma absolute value of 2r, takes care of the case where it's negative, divided by 2n. The change in the level divided by the total number of ballots in the election. OK, the how long do I have left? I got 10 minutes. Well, I'll give it a try. I think I can do the proof, and then I'll do the example for review next time. This next result is absolutely amazing. Uh, I would never have guessed the answer to this question if I hadn't seen it in uh, the textbook. So here is, here is the deal. Harvard and Yale agree they're going to play lots and lots of football games. The nation was just captivated by that triple overtime. And so we've got game after game after game. And they agree they're going to play until the series is tied. Yeah. Topic 10. Oh, topic 10. Thank you. So this is topic Not 10. Not that pen, Paul. What? Not that pen. Not that pen. <laughs> what have we got? Well, we'll switch to black. No, we haven't used black. Black's, That's good. Black looks bad when erased, but, uh, but okay. So this is expected lead time. So the deal is, Harvard and Yale are going to play a series of football games, and they're going to play until the series is tied. That means they may play as few as two games, but they may pay a very large number of games also. You don't know how long the series is going to be. <coughs> and uh, Dean Schenagel helped broker this deal and is told that as a reward for his skill in brokering this deal, that he can pick some number r, and whenever Harvard is precisely R games ahead in the series. Every extension degree or certificate candidate gets a free ticket to the game. And the question is, 
what value of r should he choose? And what's the expected number of free tickets you'll get out of this deal? So he could say, I pick r equals 4. And that means every time Harvard is four games ahead, every extension student gets in free. Or he could pick r equals 1. Or he could even be perverse and pick r equals minus 2. And the amazing answer is no matter what value of r he chooses, the expected number of free tickets is 1. OK. So now have I got your interest? I'm going to try to prove this in the last few minutes. OK. So uh, here's how we're going to do this. Using the book's notation, yeah, that was a disaster. <laughs> Might as well write with an eraser. Um, this red was working fairly well. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yes. So v sub, v sub r is the expectation of the random variable which equals 1 when h is r games ahead. This is the expected number of times in the series that Harvard is r games ahead. For example, r might equal 2. And the series might go like this. In that case, there are three times during the series that you get your free ticket. So we're trying to find the expected value of that random variable. And I found it useful to introduce uh, an extra random variable, which I'm going to call x sub r comma n. And this random variable is equal to 1 if Harvard is r games ahead after n games. So in this particular example, x sub 2 comma 2 would be equal to 1 because Harvard is two games ahead after two games have been played. Uh, x sub 2, 2 comma 3 would be 0 because Harvard isn't, but x sub, x sub 2 comma 4 is. And the nice thing about that is that if I sum up the value of this variable for all values of n, I get the number of times that Harvard is a game ahead, and that's the number of free tickets. So I can now say v sub r is equal to the sum over r. And I'm going to write this as a sum up to infinity, though the series will presumably be tied at some point. So in practice, the sum will only be finite. So it is the expectation of the sum of all these x's And what's the smallest number of games that can be played for Harvard to have an R game lead? R? Oh, sorry. I said this wrong. I have to sum from n. What's the smallest value of n after which Harvard could have a lead of R games? R. 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 Yeah. OK, so everyone agree that's the quantity we want. And now the expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectations. And so I can say this is the sum from n equals r to infinity of a quantity that I'm now going to call f sub r of n. Now, let's think about f sub r of n. F sub r of n will be 1 if Harvard is r games ahead after n games and the series has never been tied. So F sub r of n is, on the one hand, the probability that h is 
far games ahead after n games no ties yeah. <coughs> and something I forgot to tell you about this is Harvard and Yale are perfectly equally matched this only works if uh, Harvard and Yale have equal chances of winning each game but now there's another interpretation of this this is saying that we've got a way of getting here that satisfies the ballot theorem right the series was never tied but the probability that we'll have a path that satisfies the, the ballot theorem condition is the same as the probability that we'll have a path that satisfies the hitting time theorem condition and the hitting time theorem condition says this is the first time that Harvard has opened up a lead of R games in their series so this same quantity is also the probability that H is R <coughs> games ahead for the first time after n games. These two things are equal because the ballot theorem and the hitting time theorem are the same theorem. If you look at all the ways that the series can start out and end up here, there are exactly the same number of paths that go from here to here without the series being tied that qualifies you for a free <coughs> ticket as there are ones that go from here to here with the series possibly being tied but Harvard never going that far ahead so this sum is the sum from n equals r to infinity of the probability that H is R games ahead for the first time. Now, if you add up the probability that Harvard is R games ahead, let's say R is 3, if you add up the probability that Harvard is 3 games ahead for the first time after 3 games, 4 games, 5 games, 6 games, 7 games, add it up for all values from 3 up to infinity, the sum of all those is the probability of what event? Come on, it's simple. You add up the probability that Harvard is three games ahead after three, four, for the first time. After three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven games. You sum that up, you get the probability that Harvard is ever R games ahead. Because if Harvard is ever R games ahead, there has to be some first time that they were that far ahead. And we've added it up. So this is the probability that H is ever R games ahead. Now, actually, it's sufficient that P is not less than 1 half. If Harvard's a better team than Yale, then this is sure to happen. But Gambler's Ruin also tells us that even if the teams are equally matched, this is sure to happen. So as long as Harvard is not worse than Yale, it's guaranteed that this will equal 1, and this equals the expected number of free tickets, which equals 1, which completes the proof. But I'll start out next time by showing you a numerical example of how this works in very simple cases, because even when it's proved, it still looks a bit implausible.